Good morning again. Lieutenant General John Sams, United States Air Force retired, class of 1967, assumed the role as the Citadel's interim president in July 2018. He returned to his alma mater after a distinguished career in the Air Force, industry, and service as the chairman of the Citadel Board of Visitors. Lieutenant General Sams leverages his extensive leadership, military, and business experience, along with a lifelong association with the Citadel to lead his alma mater as interim president. He's a rated command pilot who flew the B-52, the B-1, the E-4, and C-7 aircraft. Lieutenant General Sams commanded at the squadron and wing level and retired as commander, 15th Air Force. His involvement with the Citadel is extensive, culminating as chairman of the Board of Visitors. Lieutenant General Sams and his classmates conceived and built the Citadel War Memorial, which opened on homecoming of their 50th class reunion in 2017. He and Suzanne, his wife of 49 years, reside in Mount Pleasant, South Carolina. He is also the grandfather of a 2016 Citadel graduate. It is my great pleasure to introduce Lieutenant General John Sams. Well, let me join a long list of folks that have already shared with me what a great beginning we have to this conference. And thank you all for being here. I think this is probably uh, going to be remembered as one of the great venues and one of the great efforts uh, to highlight cyber, cybersecurity, intelligence, uh, and put these issues on the map. Thank you for being here. And while I'm at it, since I may not have a chance, Let's thank, thank Carl and his team for what they've done in putting this together and making it such a great affair for us. You know, at the Citadel, we talk a lot about educating and preparing principal leaders. Our keynote speaker today is certainly an individual that personifies what we would define as a principal leader. The DNI has served his country his entire life. He started by serving in the United States Army. He was elected to Congress. He was elected to the Senate. He respected his vow on term limits and left the Senate. He became the ambassador to Germany. He then returned to the Senate where he with members of his team wrote legislation that we can all be proud of and are proud of. So as I introduce Senator, Mr. Ambassador, Director, Dan Coates to our stage, please realize that what we have here today, ladies and gentlemen, is a great American. Sir, thank you for coming. General, that's uh, one of the nicer, or nicest, uh, uh, introductions that I've uh, enjoyed. I, Sort of, uh, I think you and I sort of fall in the same category. We don't know when to quit. Uh, <laughs> I graduated in 65, you in 67, so we've been around quite a while. Um, but service to the country um, has a great reward. And uh, some, I guess it reminds me of a story about the pastor uh, giving preaching and then uh, standing at the door as the Congregation walked out and people were pastor wonderful sermon and so forth and Betsy came by and he said oh Betsy you're so faithful you're here and, oh I am every Sunday she said and he said well what did you think of my 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 lecture or not my preaching today oh she said I thought it was really wonderful she said but I think you missed a golden opportunity oh he said well, what was that he said to quit uh, <laughs> uh, 
I hope that doesn't apply to either you or me, but uh, anyway, I really am appreciative of the opportunity uh, to be here today. Uh, I'm here because uh, one of your graduates, Dan Barrett, uh, who is in the audience here somewhere, he said, don't introduce me. I said, no, you're the reason why I'm here. Uh, Deputy Di Director of the Department of Energy, we serve in the cabinet uh, together, and uh, Dan said, uh, we'd love to have you come down for this, and, and so I, I immediately said yes. Uh, I want to do that if we can schedule it, and we were able to do so. But I had some ulterior motives in mind. First of all, Charleston's a very nice place to come to. Uh, uh, my wife and I have been here on several occasions. Uh, she is the Navy sponsor of a, of a DD-51 uh, uh, USS McFall, and it was christened here in Charleston. She had the choice of where to have it christened, and it was here in Charleston because we had some friends here that could join us uh, in that process. And so that was one reason that it's nice to be back for that memory. Uh, my uh, daughter married into the Army, and uh, they were stationed at Fort Stewart, so we made several trips here while they were there. And now my grandson, who was a young uh, Airborne Ranger, uh, has just told us last week uh, his next assignment will be at Fort Stewart. So this is another uh, opportunity uh, to be here. And there's one other special opportunity. Uh, more than 40 years ago, um, I joined uh, the organization called Big Brothers Big Sisters. And uh, um, in that program, uh, adopted a little brother by the name of C.J. Bundy. Uh, we have been lifelong friends, and uh, he now lives in Charleston. And this young little eight-year-old uh, from some tough background is now president of a very significant company here in Charleston. But beyond that, became the chairman uh, and president of the Greater Charleston Big Brothers Big Sisters. And I thought that was an accomplishment of extraordinary. <laughs> So um, there they are. And so I want, you, Jason, you and your wife Molly to stand up and just be recognized. <laughs> now, uh, after Dan uh, asked me to come, um, I found out that I looked at some of the people who have spoken here before, Prince of Wales. Two commandants of the Marine Corps, um, Henry Kissinger, Justice O'Connor, Bob Hope, and I said, Dan, who canceled? Uh, <laughs> so for better or worse, uh, better or worse, here I am. And I'm very happy to be here. Um, you know, in some of the worst moments uh, for your fellow South Carolinians and North Carolinians, uh, uh, this uh, Hurricane Florence uh, really left some uh, people in tough situations, and our heart goes out to hearts go out to those. But in the worst moments that usually follow uh, natural disasters, we see the best of humanity, and we've seen the responses from Americans all over the country, and even some from around the world that are responding uh, to uh, pitch in and help, which says a lot about, I think, Americans and their willingness to help their neighbor. Uh, but we live in difficult times, but it makes it all the more important that those who get involved, whether it's on a charitable basis, whether it's on a humanitarian basis, or those who get involved in national security issues engage each other in venues like this about the challenges that we face from now a very long list of adversaries around the world. But my remarks today are basically going to focus on the threat from China, which is a potent adversary on very many fronts, including the cyber domain. Let me set the scene first. As the President's national security strategy notes, we are in the midst of a great power competition as Russia and China apply different strategies to challenge American power, American influence, 
and American interests in an effort to erode those security and prosperity elements that define our nation. In recent months, I have spoken out uh, candidly about the persistent and pervasive Russian effort to undermine our democracy. This challenge continues to be at the forefront of our current threat environment. And the various agencies that make up the intelligence community are working together and with our partners in law enforcement more closely than we ever have before to counter these malign activities. But having said this, uh, we also face a separate challenge that is more methodical than the threat that is posed by Russia. All here today at this conference know that Russia's long-term ambition is to be a global power. But the key thing that distinguishes Russia from, uh, excuse me, China, from Russia is that China benefits from a relatively stable U.S.-China relationship and international system that is more predictable and less contentious. So in contrast to Russia, China often executes its strategy in a more deliberate and subtle manner, and that tends to generate less media and public attention. China benefits from a more stable system because it is able to focus on domestic problems and economic growth with an emphasis on trying, without an emphasis on trying to match U.S. military power. Stability also allows China to dedicate huge sums of money on research and development to improve their indigenous capabilities while at the same time exploiting our government and military transparency and our open society to acquire knowledge that allows them to close their critical national security and defense capability gaps. Since President Xi became Communist Party leader and military commander in chief in 2012, Beijing appears to have abandoned its previous policy of, quote, hiding its strengths and biding its time, and embraced as a whole of government a strategy to achieve strategic goals that China believes will lead to, at the very least, equality and perhaps even global supremacy. Having said this, however, despite positive messages at the beginning of President Xi's term, his regime's crackdown on dissident public information and human rights has intensified markedly. In its effort to repress religion and dissent at home and exert its influence abroad, Beijing has become more aggressive. We now estimate that the Chinese government has detained hundreds of thousands and perhaps millions of its Muslim citizens, including families and children, in its centers for as what they call patriotic re-education. Detainees are required to learn the Chinese language, watch pro-government propaganda videos, and renounce their ethnic identities, and most important, their renouncing of their religious beliefs. More ominously, from a cyber perspective, Chinese officials in the Muslim Northwest have instituted high-tech surveillance measures, including the collection of DNA and other biodata throughout the region with Chinese technology companies at the forefront of these actions. These draconian, indiscriminate, and disproportionate controls on ethnic minorities raise serious human rights concerns and have the potential to incite radicalization and violent extremism, and to turn limited support for separatism into a popular movement. Both in the Muslim-dominated Northwest, as well as in the rest of China, the government is experimenting with a social credit rating program. It monitors online activity, payment of highway tolls, and other massive data collection and surveillance to determine access to bank loans, education, and even medical care. The regime is tightening its control over China's top internet companies to exploit the firm's growing power to penetrate Chinese society and restrict the public from gathering and gaining access to information. In 2016, Beijing passed legislation that compels citizens to give authorities unfettered access to their data, 
which strengthens social controls and tools for political repression. The result of this effort is nothing short of a future that involves the perfection of the surveillance state and also threatens the export of these tools abroad to other authoritarian regimes. As China enhances its domestic security apparatus, it is also asserting a whole of nation strategy in the cyber domain that is unprecedented in scale. China has been among the most active foreign states conducting cyber activities against the United States interests. The Chinese government uses all of the capabilities at their disposal to influence U.S. policies, spread propaganda, manipulate the media, and pressure individuals, including students, critical of Chinese policies. China is also targeting U.S. state and local governments and officials. It is trying to exploit any divisions between federal and local levels on policy and uses investments and other incentive to, incentives to expand its influence. The threat from cyber activities is even more clear. From its continued hacking of our defense secrets to its focus on collecting vast repositories of personal and personality identifying in information to better enable espionage activities, China exploits our transparency and open society. In the cyber domain, China seeks to influence international cyber norms, emphasizing state sovereignty over information. Beijing is working against, against the values that the international community has championed, including protecting personal privacy, the free flow of information, and the protection of commercial secrets. In summary, China seems determined to marshal its growing economic and military clout including cyber prowess, artificial intelligence, biodata, and big data science to position itself for dominance in the economy of the 21st century. My role and the challenge that we in the IC have is to face this looming threat. My job leading the U.S. intelligence community is to ensure that we provide the warning and insight to our customers. And we are fortunate because we are not easily influenced. And most of our institutions have risen to resist these pressures and shown a light on these procedures. We are educating the private sector about Chinese activities and sharing information about cyber threats. We've warned universities about Chinese efforts to exploit our academic system. We're engaging with state and local officials about the threats they face from foreign influence and cyber intrusions. And at the federal level, our intelligence informs the policy debates about our national response to China's rise. This role of intelligence is vital to a safeguard our society against those who seek to undermine our democracy, our free society, and our vibrant private sector. Before concluding, I'd like to talk briefly about the importance of public service and careers in the intelligence community. I'm fully aware of the sense of service that runs through the veins of those here at the Citadel. And to those students that uh, are here today and others for other purposes, I just want to uh, encourage them uh, to think about the value of playing a role in serving your country in, a, many, in many different ways, obviously through military service, through the service in the intelligence communities, through, uh, through other public service, including elected uh, uh, officials. On the wall of my office in the Senate, and now at the ODNI, is a World War II plaque that states, Uncle Sam needs you. And I'm here today to say to those of you in the audience, who may be thinking about your future and your careers. Uncle Sam needs you. We need leaders with integrity and professionalism and a sense of duty. And that is what you are learning here at the Citadel. We offer a, a wide range of professions in the intelligence community, from analysts to engineers to operatives, all united by our common service to national security. Now, you might be able to find a career, in fact, you could find a career 
because you're going to get a good education here, that pays more and offers an easier lifestyle. But I can assure you that serving your country and joining the mission of protecting the American public from harm is a reward worth pursuing. And I can guarantee you, you will never be bored. So thank you for the opportunity to join you today. I hope that this perspective on China that I have offered will contribute to your discussions going forward here in this uh, conference, particularly on cybersecurity. And now I'm told I'm going to be joined by Professor Jensen to address some of the questions that you might have. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be with you. Thank you very much, Director Coates, um, for those remarks. Uh, we knew this was going to be a very popular uh, talk, and as a result, uh, we wanted to be as fair as we possibly could, uh, both to our folks who are here in the audience, and also to our online students who couldn't be here but are watching this on Facebook. So um, we solicited questions from folks, and uh, the director has uh, been gracious enough to go ahead and answer those. So I'll go ahead and ask some of the questions that were uh, sent in to us. And let me go ahead and start. This, is, this comes from um, Rebecca Benzen, who is one of our Citadel on online undergraduates. And her question is, and uh, you talked about, obviously, China as being one of the big challenges that we have out there today. Um, what are two of the other big challenges that, that you see on the horizon that the IC is dealing with? Well, I think we're reading about this every day. Um, we are spread across the world uh, in a way uh, relative, challenged uh, by uh, any number of uh, conflicts and potential conflicts uh, more diverse than I think any of us have seen in our lifetime. Uh, those challenges that provoke uh, 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 ways in which um, harm can be done to the American economy, to the American people, uh, to our values, to our democracy uh, in ways that we have used to see in a Cold War, but now see it coming from disparate places across the, across the world. We are stretched militarily. We are stretched from an intel, uh, intelligence standpoint. We are stressed uh, from a foreign policy standpoint. And so we are dealing with a, a number of uh, uh, issues here that have um, required uh, significant engagement and resources uh, to, to address this. Um, so it's not just one or two focuses, but it's, it is focuses across and around the world. And it requires the very best from us to stay on top of all of this. Um, we now also face a threat which we haven't faced before. In every conflict, uh, I think in the history of man, people on both sides of the conflict have one internal desire, and that is to not be killed. We are now dealing with a jihadist theology and ideology that basically says to attain the greatest glory you can attain in life, you need to kill yourself, but make sure you kill somebody else along with you. An infidel that we have defined that doesn't adhere to our beliefs. Um, the, the, our goal, our mission, is to kill that infidel. And so that poses an extremely different a challenge uh, to us. And if you think about marrying that ideology and theology of jihadism with weapons of mass destruction, uh, it poses an existential threat to the United States, to democracy, to people around the world. Um, and this is a challenge, and people say what keeps you up at night. It is that potential combination in marriage of a successful attack, whether it's from bio, whether it's from cyber, excuse me, from through cyber, uh, potentially, whether it's nuclear uh, or uh, chemical. Um, that is a threat that we have not had to deal with, and that requires a great deal of effort uh, to challenge, to uh, make sure we det can deter that from happening. Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, I 
when I began my career, um, it, I was a cold warrior, so um, we basically had the one big challenge. So, um, yes, yeah, we absolutely. knew where the bad guys were, and yes, we sir. knew where the, we were, and they, we knew what they had, and they knew what we had, and, and if we, we were very conscious of the fact that uh, we weren't going to survive either right. way. Yeah, absolutely, That's not true absolutely, now. no. Much more complex challenges out there today. Um, this question, and I'm going to paraphrase it a little bit, comes from Harrison Durland, who is a student at the University of Mississippi. And um, Harrison uh, wonders, and many of my students ask this same question, with the rise of artificial intelligence, um, how should students who want to be intelligence analysts look at their future careers in the Bureau? Um, in the coming decades, will there be as many meaningful jobs for human beings in the intel world uh, as a result of artificial intelligence? And how, how's that going to work? Well, uh, Harrison, don't worry. Um, there's, uh, <laughs> there are going to be plenty of jobs available out there because somebody's got to process this volume of data that is flowing into our abilities to collect, and we've got to sort that out. Uh, right now, uh, National Geographic, uh, no, Geospatial now they call it, um, agency uh, collects, uh, can only assess 20% of the volumes of data that flows in down from the satellites, down from the collections that we come in every, every day. You can't hire enough people to begin to assess what is we need to see and what don't we need to see out of that, how we process that. What artificial intelligence and machine learning is going to give us is the opportunity to sort out the essential. But in the end, a judgment has to be made relative to that information, and that cannot be made by the machine. We don't want to rely on that because we know, number one, it can be hacked, it can be modified, it can be manip manipulated, uh, and secondly, um, uh, Human experience, human judgment is something you can't teach a machine. So there'll be plenty of jobs available for you. In fact, uh, our problem now is, is that uh, we need, um, uh, we have more demands for these types of capabilities, including cyber uh, security and so forth, than we have uh, supply. So uh, those of you who are in the curriculum that fits in these uh, uh, categories, uh, where we, Uncle Sam needs you. And hopefully my, all my students were taking notes on that last one. Thank you. Um, and finally, I think we have, we have time for one more question. Um, you talked about the challenges that we have out there that are facing us, and it's an increasingly complex world. Um, it, how successful has the IC been in getting beyond the Cold War mindset that we developed um, during that period. Are, are we doing a pretty good job, and how can we do better? Well, I think we're doing a good job. Uh, we can always do better. But following 9-11, as everyone knows, um, we did an extensive review through the Congress, through independent agencies, uh, uh, the 9-11 Commission, and the recommendations that were made were designed to basically restructure the entire intelligence community. And restructure it in a way, including defense intelligence. Structure it in a way where we were not in what they called individual stovepipes, but we were integrating our process. I like, I take, well, let's, let's use a football example. Football's big, I know, in South Carolina, and uh, big here at the Citadel. Um, my daughter's a graduate of Furman. She was, they always worried about playing the Citadel. Uh, uh, so um, look, you've you've got a bunch of elements here who, you know, you you've got the linebackers and you got the the defensive line and you got the offensive line. You have 80 some players and you interject them and so forth, but you're working on for one result. And that result cannot be achieved unless you, the t everybody on that team is performing in the way they need to perform. Uh, if the safety is not up to speed, or if the linebacker is not doing his job, et cetera, everybody contributes to the ultimate result. In painting the picture that we present to our policymakers, or fulfilling, putting the puzzle together, we need to take the elements of all the different agencies that are engaged in collecting intelligence and put that together. And you know, sure, CIA puts a lot of pieces in that puzzle, 
NSA puts a lot of Singit pieces in that puzzle. Um, uh, NGA puts a lot of imaging into that puzzle. But defense intelligence agencies, the various services, um, uh, the Department of Treasury, uh, the Coast Guard, each may have pieces of that puzzle that you can't get the full picture without putting it all together. And so the function of the ODNI, Office of Director of National Intelligence, is to oversee that process of 16 other agencies that are all collecting and assessing and managing and massaging and putting together and analyzing uh, to, and then bringing it to, through us, the ODNI, so that we paint that final picture or we uh, uh, put that final puzzle uh, in place has come light years from where we were pre-9-11. It's a constant, ongoing, how can we be better? How can we do more? But we are now a team. I realized from day one when I took this job that the first responsibility I had and needed to do was to establish a relationship between all 17 of our components so that we had a trusted relationship in working to share information, not jealousy, not, hey, they do more than what we do. Uh, now you can't count on them. Build that trusted relationships that we are not going to deal with the challenges of tomorrow if we do not have a team put together that is one team led by a coach who has terrific people with all the necessary talents and, and, and experience and education to direct and operate all these other 16 agencies. Um, but if we, don't, if we don't come together as one team, we're not going to achieve our purpose and we're not going to protect the American public with the responsibilities we have to do so. Sir, thank you very much. Um, I see by the clock we could we could do this all day. I wish we could. Unfortunately, uh, we have uh, other panels and other committees. I wish we could do it all day. I'd have to go right back to Washington. Right? <laughs> but, but, sir, I want to thank you very, very much and thank your staff very, very much. We know how incredibly busy you are and what an important job you had. Um, you have, and for you to, to carve time out of your schedule to come down here and participate in our conference, we are so very, very grateful. Thank well, you very much. Well, it's a privilege much. for me to be here. Thanks for the invitation to so do so. So please, let's give a round of applause to Director Coates.